I'm hooked up here. So, so um, there are inhibitors uh, in the peripheral nerve, the proteoglycans, uh, especially around the, in the basal lamina. And uh, often what people have done in the past for nerve um, transfers is to pre-degenerate to get rid of those inhibitory molecules. But David Muir, uh, University of Florida in Gainesville, mm -hmm. has shown that if you chondroitinase treat a fresh nerve, which is what you're working with, mm -hmm. uh, that, that dramatically helps remove any of those inhibitors and allows for much better regeneration in peripheral nerve um, types of regeneration settings. So now, I've seen that applied to grafting. To grafting. So oxygen and that sort of thing, they're, they're degenerating and it's in their... Right, so they add saying, but it seems to me that when you cut the nerve mm -hmm. and you graft, you're going to get some, there, there are going to be some inhibitors there. So, so a little you bit of chondroitinase. Ta taking that distal, the distal end where those axons are going to go into in. A shot of chondroitinase on both sides. On both sides. I think that would, could be remarkably helpful. Okay. So faster, better. Sounds good to me. But I mean, the whole thing you presented is remarkable that the brain can figure this stuff out. Yeah, it, it, it is amazing. And, and it, you do have to take in consideration brain, brain injury. Those patients don't do as well. So, so if you've had a concomitant brain injury with the spinal cord injury, you, it really is dependent upon somebody who's able to learn, able to develop some sophistication with what they do have before you can go to the next level. If, if you don't have good facile control of the muscles that your brain does control, then rewiring them to something else is not going to work as well. So it's, it's a mixed bag. Well, why don't we field some questions? Yes, sir? Yeah, incredibly interesting. I'm a C5-6 myself, so. Um, what about the scenario where you could actually extend or use nerves from your legs and move the, you know, e essentially bridge from the nerve where it exits the spinal cord below the level of the lesion and plug that back into the, if you were, the stump, if you were to create a stump and use chondroitinase there to plug it back in above, you know, my lesion Cord to cord? Yeah, well, essentially, if you were to, let, let's just say you were to cut the cord, mm -hmm. and then you were to take the nerves yeah, that head off from below the nerve, the, below the, the lesion level, so that innervate, let's say, my, my legs or my intercostals or something like that, and bridge them up and plug them into the bottom of the spinal cord. Right. And just, just l let the brain figure it out. What would... So, so that's, kind of a, that's kind of a Karlstedt, Thomas uh, yeah. avulsion. So, so uh, the dorsal root entry zone is, is another barrier to regeneration. So axons regenerating into the spinal cord or towards the spinal cord from the sensory nerves. So you know, they can regenerate not only out towards the muscles and skin, they can also regenerate in the roots back towards the spinal cord. But when they get to the cord, they stop. So when you take a nerve and you put it back into the cord, you have all the same problems that we do after a spinal cord injury. So the axons get stuck. But, but we've published papers that suggest that the same strategies, chondroitinase, and in, increasing the intrinsic growth response can get axons, at least sensory axons, back in. There's some work from Thomas Karlstedt and Leif Hafton uh, that, that um, if, you, if you stick uh, uh, roots uh, towards in the vicinity of the motor neurons, those axons can come out. But the scenario that I think you're, you're, you're talking about is a little, we'll have to talk about this more, but it, it seems, it just seems like anatomically that it's not going to work. Did you? Yeah, there is, there is a bunch of papers by, by a gentleman named Giorgio Brunelli from Italy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and he, he has been doing this where he plugs it in the corticospinal tract and talks about those axons actually growing to the muscle itself. Yeah, I saw it, him in uh -huh. the, about three years ago, and it's profound the functionality that, that you can get in terms of just legs are going crazy. Well, it's, it's, it's a, and it's a fascinating like concept that, that it works because it talks about a, a different neurotransmitter. It's tr plasticity of transmitters. A different neurotransmitter is somehow activating the muscle, which we never would have guessed would activate the muscle. But the downside of this is that you are losing all the amplification that you would have within the spinal cord. So you've got a weak cortical signal that usually comes down to the spinal cord, and then you have pattern generators and this sort of thing amplifying it to a signal that would really make those muscles move. Now you're bypassing that entire system and going directly to the muscles. So the amount of energy required to activate that muscle in a useful way is, is tremendous. And so I don't think that's going to be a long-term strategy, but it's a very important concept to keep moving the, forward, the field forward. Yes, ma'am. 
Dr. Brown, would you discuss um, the thoughts of taking like an intercostal nerve and then transferring it, say, for hip flexion or even the lower um, trunk regions? Um, in, intercostal to distal nerve or to cord? To, to distal. To distal nerve. Uh, I have done one of those cases, and I realized after my first couple of these nerve transfer cases that, that we were on the wrong path <clears throat> with, with one's con concept, and that is it was so easy to take apart those nerves distally and stimulate them and see what the target is and know that you're sending the right accents to the target, that we were doing this without completely denervating the target. That means we were leaving some of the dysfunctional axons, the ones that cause spasticity, in there. And I'm going to talk while I have this down. If you imagine if you have five axons that go to a target and you have one left over, and the other four have to come from proximal, that one is going to sprout and take over those muscles well before the other one's going to move their way in there to compete with it. And so the one, the one that I did, I, I did that sort of a transfer on, and the, the, the recovery hasn't been great. So what you would need to do is, number one, if you're going to go to a quadriceps, you need a lot of accents. You'd need several intercostals. So you're going to, there's always a cost to this. You're going to lose some of your trunk balance, some of your sit-up function, and then you need to completely transect that femoral nerve and, and put it in there. So you could get some function, but I've had a lot of patients call me up and say, you know, I'm, I'm a T8 injury. Can you take what I have left over and make my legs move? And not very well. We could go after a gluteal target. We could go after a knee extensor target. How strong is it going to be? And is it going to bear your weight? Probably not. We could probably get it to move. Um, but that, that's still going to be a tough one to do without making the cord better. Yes, sir. Um, both of you, excellent work. Thank you very much for presenting today. Dr. Silver, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of uh, Susan Harkema. I am. Mm -hmm. And uh, the epidural stimulation trials that she's currently um, doing. And one of the fascinating aspects of that is that the um, the, the point was to try and get motor function, obviously, but in, in um, at least two of the subjects, now three, by her personal report, they're actually seeing spontaneous bladder and bowel improvement. Um, so I'm wondering if you just want to comment on that based on your, your observations and your studies and your models. Yes. Um, I think what, what we're learning is some of these more primitive systems, bladder and perhaps bowel and maybe even sexual function, uh, are intrinsically plastic. That is, the, the, the descending nerve fibers that innervate the motor neurons that control these functions uh, either sprout and or can regenerate um, to some extent on their own. And what we're doing in our lab is to giving that plasticity some help from above. Now, um, it, it is conceivable that if so, so the spinal cord uh, is, is really trying to rewire itself. And we think for some of these primitive functions working really hard. Uh, and we just need to kind of increase the gain, uh, increase the input to some threshold. Uh, we're doing it by regeneration of long track fibers in the rodent. Uh, but it's also possible to increase the gain by epidural stimulation. So you increase the excitability of the spinal cord. And those rewired circuits that aren't working without epidural stim now all of a sudden function. Uh, what I also think is a really important concept to, to ponder about is the possibility that the restored function, all right, that is being brought about by the epidural stimulation and, and training also increases plasticity just by working the system. Um, I hear anecdotal uh, stories from a guy named Anders at the, uh, the, the VA at, at, uh, at Case Western uh, people who are on diaphragm pacemakers. And he tells me anecdotally that sometimes um, there seems to be some kind of plasticity and people go off the pacemaker. That there's some, there's some, so activity itself uh, can enhance plasticity. So I, I, I am looking forward, I hope, to combining epidural stim and or rehab uh, with our bridge building techniques and or these nerve, various nerve transfer techniques that we just heard about to try to maximize the output of what the nervous system is trying to do. But what's really cool is that the, the brain figures this stuff out. You know, I, all these axons that are regenerating, we're, we're not controlling them. Uh, they're going where they may. And yet the output uh, that we see in the animals is, is improving. They, they don't get worse if we do things right. So I, I'm just really optimistic, especially after hearing this talk, 
that, that the, brain, the brain can figure stuff out. So maybe we don't have to be so, 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 so perfect in our regeneration. We just got to get some axons to go. So this is, yeah, the, the, but the bladder really is, the animals can pee. They don't walk so well, a little bit. But, but uh, I think these primitive functions are, are something we can approach. I had another question for you, Dr. Silver. I was a little confused with the proprio-spinal neurons. Yeah. Is it simply that after the glial scar is cleaned up a little bit and you inject the chondroitinase, so they just grow on their own? Yes. Like they, they would just do that anyway, so there's nothing else that needs to be done to spur on proprio-spinal neurons? They'll just go, go if they have the room? They go. Uh, it's been shown um, in a cat model that certain types of proprio-spinal neurons have the ability to grow past a very small scar that's created with a very thin knife. So, so they have an intrinsic capacity to regenerate. Also, we're finding that certain brainstem neurons, the ones I showed you, ha have a, a very strong capacity to regenerate if they're given a chance to get past the scar. So that's what we're trying to do. And we're using peripheral nerves as a guide and getting rid of the barrier molecules. But once they're across, very slowly, they just keep on going. Now, uh, we, we have focused on bladder function because that's what comes back the best. But I did not point out that the animals do regain some ability to move, but I wouldn't call it walking. They go from a BB score of two to a BB score of seven, which is five points, but a seven is not all that spectacular. That's basically the ability to move three joints okay. without any weight bearing versus one joint. So I don't, I don't, you know, kind so of triumph in that. But but bladder, but bladder. So there is probably some activity, some locomotor activity, mediated by proprio-spinal system or the gigantocellular nucleus for very crude kinds of locomotor responses, but nothing close to walking. Would it would it be worth investigating then, uh, adding some kind of locomotor therapy? Absolutely. To see, to see if that spurs on better proprial spinal absolutely, growth absolutely, and then resulting absolutely, in... Absolutely. Great point. That's exactly what we want to do. We want to see if we can now maximize this, you know, what we've got uh, that we know can regenerate if given an opportunity uh, and, and make, make those even better. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm not... I mean, we, we just don't really, especially at chronic stages, uh, we don't see any evidence of return of any locomotor function. Uh, in, our, in the chronic animals, that last slide I presented. So nothing so far. But we do see a return of some bladder function. But chronically then, would it not, would it not be worth still trying to add some kind of locomotor component? I'm not done yet. I told or... you, we talked about that wound preparation phase. Now we're going to go. Now I'm inviting everybody, everybody I see, everybody I talk to, everybody who hears about this, to add their expertise, their ideas, their strategies to try to get other axons to grow. And I, I, I'm a firm believer that once they're past the scar, they keep going. And now that I've heard, it looks like the brain can, can really help fix stuff that's, that's even malwired and, and beautifully. I, I was shocked and, and thrilled to, to see your presentation. That's just incredible.